Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the house of our God. Thank God for Sundays, amen. Man, if it wasn't for Sundays, sometimes we'd never stop. Amen. Welcome to the house of our God. Trick, welcome back. We enjoyed the worship, amen. Praise God. You know, let us always be reminded that this house is like no other house on earth. It is the house of our God. Amen. And we say that with absolute purpose. You know, life is filled with so much busyness. And even when you come to church on a Sunday, perhaps even sit there on a Sunday morning, it's hard to uh, get the mind to shut down, you know. Sometimes it's hard to even listen to a certain message because the mind just drifts. It's hard to even enjoy a moment because you're always thinking about so many things that need to get done. Amen, everybody. But this is the house of our God. And I pray that we take advantage of it. I was reminded of the time when, uh, when Jesus, when he went into the temple. And he went into the temple that, that one Sabbath, and, he, and it was a Passover. And he found that there was so much business going in, on inside the house. And you know, you know the, the account very well. It said that he, he, um, he drove the money changers out. And he turned the tables over. Right? He was like, a, I don't know, a madman, right? I'm surprised nobody stopped him. I guess, I don't know, you're in a certain mode. Like, you know, you ever see somebody in a certain mode? Like, nobody dare stop him, you know? But he drove him out and he said, you have turned my father's house. It's a house of prayer. And he said, you've turned it into a place of business. Amen. And, you know, he said, let's keep this place holy. Amen, everybody. Because our lives are filled with so much business and so much transaction and so many things to do. As you look at your list of things to do, I'm sure you're overwhelmed. Anybody? I mean, and sometimes you get so overwhelmed, you just shut it down and just say, just take care of the moment, right? Just, just take care of the moment. The next moments will come by themselves. But I pray that this house is always a gift to us. I pray that we're reminded when we walk into this house that it's a, it's a gift. It's a place of prayer. It's a place of solace, of meditation. You know, let us, let us in this house, everybody, since life is so busy, let us just consider God, who is greater than us all. Amen. Let us consider God, who is able to stop time, because he, he lives in eternity. I know time is so valuable to us. We count it, and we, 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 we deal with it so, 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 so meagerly. But he's the one that creates time. God has the ability to, to cause you to sit down and have a, a moment of peace and still take care of all of your business that needs to be taken care of. Does anybody believe that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. Because <laughs> if your minds drift and wander, I, obviously you, you think that you still have to take care of the business of the day, right? If you're still thinking about what you're doing after church and what you're doing tomorrow, right? That will determine, you know, um, where we are. But I think God, I really believe that God wants to uh, uh, give us something to think about today. He wants us to ponder. You know, you got so many things to do in life. God forbid you come to church and we give you another list of things to do. Like, I, I, I can't, my list already? <laughs> I can't complete that list. Don't add to my list, you know? Amen? It's like, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Please, no more lists. <laughs> We're overwhelmed as it is. Amen? I think he just wants to give us something to think about. And maybe if God would allow you just a moment, maybe you could ponder. If we could only just stop and ponder, it would change the course of our life. You know that? We don't give ourselves enough time just to ponder, just to sit in quietness, just to stare into space. When's the last time you just stared? It could have been recently, I don't know, but when's the last time you just stared into, into the sky? And did nothing. I think if we pondered, if we give God his moment, it could change our lives. You know that? Change what we think is so important and what we're so busy about. So, you know, the title of our conversation is Closed for Business. I do pray that there's a part of our life that God will close for business entirely. I pray that we come to a place where we live our lives in regard to what God is doing in the world and what God is doing in our lives, who we are becoming, not what we are acquiring. And at the end of our lives, in the middle of our lives, sometimes we measure our lives in regard to what we have acquired. Isn't that the truth? In this natural world, what have we acquired? 
well, I got a house, I got a car, I got a job, I have this much money, and damn that kind of thinking. Because we all measure it. And you have not acquired until you've reached a certain level. Amen. Amen. Let us sit in the house of God this morning and consider him. Because life is not about what you do and what you acquire, what you measure and what you count. At the end of your life, it's not about what you got and what you made. I became a millionaire. I, I owned a house. I owned a business. Really. It's not about what you acquired. It's about who you became. What kind of a person did you become? Because life is about becoming, not acquiring. And we are all human beings, therefore we are all, if you could say, guilty of believing the lie that it's about acquiring and we're so busy and God always wants to give us a gift. I think of the simple thing of a, of a Sabbath day. God gave us a day of rest, right? Thank God he gave us a day of rest. You know, because that's exactly what we need. Amen. Amen. So let this be your day of rest. And if you can't handle the day, then, then take a moment. If you're too busy, you can't take the day off. <laughs> and take a moment. I know you're going to be running full speed tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But God says, consider this. I think there's also an invitation with this. Let me start with, um, you have your Bibles, maybe Brother Keith can help us. Let's talk about that account where Jesus went into the temple, all right? I want to read that with you. So um, I'll read from the, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 21, and it says it was the Passover. So it says that... Um, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them out of the temple. Praise God, he had that boldness, right? That confidence. He knew who he was. He knew he had the authority to do this. And, and he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out. Could you, could you envision this? He poured out the coins of the money changes and overturned their tables. Who in their right mind is going to come up to me and take my money and throw it on the floor? I will knock them here to kingdom come. <laughs> They, 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 they wouldn't even get close to my money. I would knock them out before they got close. <laughs> he overturned. He threw their money in the dirt. That's what I think of your filthy money. Coming into my father's house and making it a place of business. It says his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Yeah, uh, that's about as bold as they could be. <laughs> and Jesus answered them and he said, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build the temple. And you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Amen, everybody. The word of the Lord. He says here, you have made my father's house, which should be a house of prayer, a house of business. You know that you are the temple of God, right? Does everybody know that? Do you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And when God says, you've turned my house, my father's house, he's speaking of you, because the most valuable thing on earth is not this structure, which is rotting and falling apart. It is your bodies. And he said, what was the grievous sin that they committed that enraged him, if you will? Because they took the father's house, which was you, because he cares about your life so much. And he says that the thieves, you, you have turned my father's house 
into a house of business. And the thieves have sent us to work and whipped us and drove us and told us to measure and count. And you don't have enough and you're not responsible and you're not, you're not good enough and you're not worthy enough. And on and on and on. And the, and, the, and, the, and the robbers and the thieves have come into my life and they've come into your life and they have stolen from you your meditation, your prayer, your, your solace, your quietness. And they have put you to work. And you can't stop working. You can't even shut your mind off. You can't even sleep at night. They've put you to work. This enraged Jesus. How dare those thieves? Who are the thieves? It's, it's, it's our old thinking, our mindsets. It's what we bow ourselves to. It's, it's old mentalities. And, and that's, because you know, you, if you think of, you know, you, uh, the, the, you know Jesus, and, like this was the one that, that, that's the big controversial. It's like, how could Jesus be so enraged? How could this, the Son of God be so enraged? What made him so angry that he, he was so violent? And I guess, you know, seemingly violent, and, and they wouldn't even dare touch him. Like, they talked about touching him, but no one would touch him or go near him. Like, who has the authority? I mean, I can't touch him. Just let him do what he's going to do. We'll talk to him later. <gasps> And, and, and what, what, what incited him was the fact that somebody turned the father's house into a place of business. You know what, man? Someone turned your house into a place of business. And you were not born or created or designed to be a place of business. Can somebody just breathe in and breathe out a little bit? And I don't know, ponder this. You have to ponder this because I don't know where you, what you can accept and I don't know where God can take you. Because sometimes we're just so driven we're driven. We're driven by the gods of this age. We're driven by, by the mammon, which is the god of wealth. We're driven by that. We're driven by that, too. That's why later on God said, you can't serve both. You can't serve God or mammon, because the other one drives us. It just drives us. It drives us. And we have this false understanding of what our life is supposed to be, everybody. We have this false understanding of what life is, and we're driven to business. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, how dare you turn my father's house? It's supposed to be a house of prayer of meditation, of pondering. You know, we should spend our time considering things, not, not counting them, not, not thinking about how to acquire and how to do and how to make and build, but rather consider our lives. Most of our, our time should be spent considering, pondering. You know, pondering what? God, the universe, humanity, what is and why it is. But well, we don't, because we're, 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 we're figuring out how to make our businesses successful and how to pay our bills and how to raise our family and, and how to send our kids to college. Amen, everybody. Amen. It's a church house, it's outside the house. And we believe it's the responsible thing to do. That's why we bow before it, because we believe the lie. Because you, you can only, listen, you know, I mean, the, the, the phrases of the world does not coincide with the phrases of the kingdom, you know? Those phrases such as uh, um, you reap what you sow in regard to, in regard to um, the things of the earth and the things of heaven. Something like forgiveness. You can never earn forgiveness. You can never pay for it. Such as unconditional love. You can never earn unconditional love. You can never pay for it. You can never measure it. You can never count it. So the kingdom of God is beyond the things of the earth. The, thing, the greatest things in the earth that the earth has can be counted and measured and, and quantified, but the things of heaven, can't, they're so, the things of heaven are so great you can't count them, you can't measure them. You know, forgiveness and mercy and love, they're so great, but yet we forsake them because we chase the business of the day. Like, I'll get a little love and mercy and forgiveness on Sunday if I got a chance, but in the meantime, I'm busy, 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 busy. And, you know, we've talked about this long enough. You know, I think we, we, we've taken off our badges of busyness. We're still busy, but at least to some degree we've taken off our badge because we think we're important because we're busy. It makes us important because we're busy, busy, busy. And God says, well, then somebody turned my house into a house of business because you're not supposed to be. Can you, can you hear that? Can you hear that God does not want you to be busy, 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 busy? But we are, Amen. Amen, everybody. We are. We are. We don't even have time for God. We don't even have time in a day just to stop and pause. If your boss ever saw you stop and pause and look into the sky, I would tell my guys, what the heck are you doing looking into the sky? <laughs> get over there and get that house done. <laughs> I mean, they called Joseph the dreamer, right? You had one man of God, he dared to dream. And what they did, killed him, sold him, whatever. Get rid of him. We got the dreamer here. Got a lot of work to do when this guy's daydreaming. <laughs> but we need dreamers. We need thinkers. 
philosophers, if you will. You know, I think about, I think about the, the philosophers and, and the thinkers of the world. They're not the rich men. No, but they're the ones that make the greatest impact. They're the ones who change our lives, the ones we quote, the ones that shape civilization. Yeah. Consider this. And Jesus says, you've turned my father's house into a house of business. And he said this. He said, destroy this temple. Destroy it. Destroy it. Destroy it. Like he dared them. He dared them. Destroy it. And they're like, we're not destroying this thing. We worship this thing, man. There's 46 years to build. We ain't destroying this. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. He First, he was talking about his body, but he knew that physical building. He knew that thing was going to be toppled, right? How many years later? 70 AD for the history buffs. 70 AD, Rome, right? They stormed Jerusalem and they tore down that temple. Not one stone was laid upon another. You know the history of it all. Jesus says, tear down this temple. Not one stone will be laid upon another. Not one. Because even the gold in the temple, they say when the gold in the temple, when the fire melted the gold, it says they who came that ransacked the temple afterwards, they, they ripped the stones apart so they can get the gold that was in between the stones so that not one stone was laid upon another. Not one stone laid upon another. Uh-huh. You know, God has the ability... Not only does he have the ability, he has the love, the zeal. Only Jesus Christ went into that temple and saw what no one else saw. Only Jesus saw what no one else saw. He says, you think there's a big thriving operation here? He says, there's nothing but filth here. And he says, I condemn it all. And we think we're thriving and we're happening and we're busy and we're doing. And Jesus says, I will end it all. I will tear it all down. And only he can do that. He's got to do it for me because I don't know how to do it and you don't know how to do it. I don't even believe in it. I believe busy is, is, is necessary, whatever. I don't know. We're, we're lost in, in our lives in confusion. But Jesus knows. He says, I'm going to tear it down. And sometimes Jesus comes into your life and my life. I know it. I know it, man. And he says, I'm just going to tear it all down. Tear what? Tear, tear, tear down the way you live, the way you think, what you value, what you, your philosophies, your, your belief system. I'm going to tear it all down. I'm going to tear you all down. I don't know, some of you are 40. It says it took them 46 years to build that temple. Some of you are 46, some of you less or more, whatever. It's a lifetime. It's a lifetime you invest. It's, and, God, and God says everything you have vet, vet invested into your philosophies, into your belief system, into, into your code of ethics and, and your business and, and everything, what you think you acquired in this life, just as I will tear it down, it means nothing. What, you drive, what, what, what drives you every day to do what you do, to get what you have. He says, I'll throw it away. I'll tear it down. It means nothing. And I know you'll, you'll leave this house so quick. We will leave this house so quick and we will go to our pursuits and we'll run our businesses and we'll get our money and we'll make our transactions and we'll do everything that we think is so important and God says that means nothing 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 I'll tear it down I'll tear it down watch me tear it down and I will and but he doesn't end he says but I will rebuild you I will rebuild you and he says three days three days is always the number of it's a number of transformation I will transform your life I will cause you to be a different person. Do you want to be a different person? Some of you guys are satisfied. <laughs> but he will cause you to be a different person. He will cause you to live differently and think differently. He says, I'm going into the temple. I'm tearing it down. Amen, everybody. You know, and, and, and I do believe that, that the difference is, 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 you know, when you talk about religion or life, I think the difference in life is, is living a transformative life in regard to living a transactional life. And I think that in our natural frame of mind, we, I think we're built this way, but we're built and designed to live a transactional life. You know, you get what you pay for, right? That's not the kingdom of heaven, by the way. That's, that's, that's the earth. We live in both, I know, but trans, we, we even live a transactional kind of a life. Everything's a transaction, you know? If you sin, you gotta pay for your sins. Well, that's not even true. Because I didn't pay for my sins. Jesus did. Amen. And you know, we go back and forth on that one simple doctrine. We believe you got to pay for your sins. Aren't we even confused about that one simple doctrine of the church, if you will? You got to pay for your sins. But doesn't the cross say otherwise? Nobody wants to talk. 
Just, just ponder. <laughs> just ponder. Yeah. The cross says, I didn't pay for my sin. But there's still a, a transactional belief system inside of us that says you're going to get what you pay for. If you sin, you're going to pay for your sins. You know, you reap what you sow. We don't understand all of the principles. You see, I believe that we live a transactional life, and I think Jesus came into the temple. He's coming into your life and my life to, 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 to tear down your transactional life. And, I, and I, listen, I don't know about you. I think I do because we're all the same, kind of. You know, I want him to tear down my transactional life because it's a hard life. But you know what's tied to that? We still desire the things of the world. I mean, we still do, desire wealth. And houses. Like, I, I'll say well, everything I got to say, but listen, I like to have money in my bank. So it's, it's, a, comp, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a paradox. It, it's, it's, only God can figure this out right now. Because I say, God, I want you to take away my transactional life. And he wants to give us a, 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 a transforming kind of a life. Well, I wrote a couple of things down here of what a transactional life is. A transactional life is, is an external life. It's us living according to externals. And we're constantly counting. How many of you are constantly counting? I mean, maybe, not, maybe not all of you, but some of you. Like I'm a counter. You know, counting, counting, counting. You, are you, anybody else a counter? I'm, I'm a counter, man. And, and, and like well, even in business sometimes, I'm always, you know, I'm always counting. Did we make money or not? <laughs> And I, and I know the Lord's always telling me, Mike, stop, because, you know, he knows I didn't make any money. He says, Mike, stop torturing yourself. Stop counting. <laughs> but I know he's always saying, stop counting. And sometimes I do stop counting. See, a transactional life is us always counting. How much money do you got? Do you guys have enough money for retirement? You got enough money for retirement? When are you going to retire? <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. I'll mess with all of you. <laughs> as far as these, these, these terms are concerned, some of you, 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 you can never retire. You better work until the day you die. <laughs> and you know it. <laughs> some of you are done working already. I got guys my age, younger than me, they're already retired. I think to myself, those rotten dogs, how dare they retire? <laughs> how dare they? I think, I think God is, 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 is wants us to consider something. When you leave, I, I, I think he just wants you to ponder certain things because transformation takes time. And I think there's an invitation to us to, to exit our transactional kind of a life and enter into a transformative kind of a life. A transactional kind of life is always counting money, uh, you know, what we earn, uh, what we spend, how much we have versus how much we need, right? I think a lot of our mind is occupied with that, everybody in this room. You know, um, I think we also measure time. Um, that, that's a transactional kind of life. You know, we measure time. First of all, we measure how much time you have in a day, right? Or how much time you have in a week. Sometimes we measure how many years you have in a life. You know, we're measuring time. And in this, in this realm, there's a, it, it's a realm of measuring and counting and a scarcity and anxiety. It's attached to the natural realm because in this natural realm, there's always scarcity. And with scarcity, everybody, you know, it's attached to it, anxiety. But there's an invitation from God to us to say you don't have to live in this place. There's something such a, so abundant about God and you and I that we have not yet realized we've turned the house of prayer into a house of business and then we live a life of scarcity and anxiety rather than abundance and faith. You can live in a life of abundance and faith, you know. You never have to be anxious and you never have to count. You always have to believe that God will provide all of your needs according to his riches and glory. He will give you food to eat every day. He says, don't I feed the birds? Don't I clothe, clothe the, the, the grass of the field? What makes you think I won't, I won't feed you? I mean, so far, everybody in this room, I think you're well fed and you got garment on your, your naked body, so you're doing all right. <laughs> and I know back in your back of your mind, yeah, well, I worked hard for this, so shut up. <laughs> shut up. There's always an answer, isn't there? There's always an answer. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah so... Transactional is always measuring, you know, how many hours in the day, how many years in the life. We're measuring reward and punishment. We measure um, justice. Justice is also a measured term. 
because there's something greater than justice, it's forgiveness, it's mercy. So we demand justice and it's righteous, is it? Thank God he don't give you justice. Because some of you would be locked up right now. <laughs> thank God there ain't no justice in this world. I know you want justice for them. But thank God I ain't behind bars right now because Lord knows, I know some of you should be there. <laughs> See, there is a different life in God. There is something that we have access to. You know, we live a transactional life, but a transformative life is an internal kind of living, everybody. It's, it's, it's living beyond the externals. It's living beyond countering and measuring. It's something like eternity. Eternity can't be measured. You want to say that you only have so many years in this life, but I would say that you are eternal. You will live forever. Amen. And these are the words of Jesus Christ himself. He says, you will live forever. So you can count your years on this earth, but you will live forever. You are eternal. Uh -huh. You are greater than this life. You're greater than this physical realm. There's a spirit inside of you that cannot be seen or measured or counted. There's something absolutely eternal, immeasurable uh, about you. But yet we confine ourselves to this lesser realm as if we are not sons and daughters of God. We say that as if it doesn't mean anything. We're sons and daughters of God. We don't know what that means. In this, um, in this realm of transformation, there's something called forgiveness. Because forgiveness can't be measured, right? It's a gift of God. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a spiritual gift we give to each other. There's something called mercy and grace, right? What's grace? Grace is getting some stuff you don't deserve. Amen. Mercy is not getting the stuff that you do deserve. <laughs> yeah. So you, can you measure that? No. You can't. Grace is, 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 is above measuring. Aren't you grateful for that? Amen. Heck yes. <laughs> Yeah. Why? Because it's God. But why do we always resort to the counting and the measuring? I don't know. Um, it's something God wants to cause us to consider and ponder. Maybe, maybe he wants to bring us out of that. Maybe he condemns this and says, you have turned my father's house into a den of iniquity, a, a place of business, a house of thieves, someone has stolen our lives. But Jesus says, no, no more. I will turn it over, I will tear it down, and I will, I will rebuild it, saith the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Let's see, you know, um, you know, it's interesting. Let's, let's turn to the book of Revelation for a second. The 13th chapter in Revelation. Now, in the 13th chapter, it talks about the beast, the number of the beast. Does anybody know the number of the beast? Six, six, six. You know, there's all kinds of teachings and everything, as there should be. But, you know, I believe that Jesus brought simplicity to the earth, not complexity. And he gave us pictures to, un to under help us understand our lives. I believe scriptures are simple, and I think when, you, when we complicate them, we... we, um, we um, we have the wrong understanding. But I, I just want to look at the simplicity of Scripture. Is that all right, Pop? Right? Just the, just the simplicity of it. Something that everybody can understand and grab hold of. So here with this beast, it's really simple. Let, let's just pick it up, the 16th verse, the 13th chapter. It says, The beast causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to receive the mark of the beast, on the right hand or on the foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is, what does it say everybody? Amen, everybody. Six, 
6, 6. And it says you cannot buy or sell unless you have the number of the beast. And this is our, 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 our life lived in a lesser realm. This is our life that we live without considering God. When I don't consider God, thank God we all took Sunday for a moment to consider God. Because sometimes we don't consider God. And when I don't consider God, I live as a beast. And I'm, all I'm worried about is buying and selling the business of a day. It's just that simple. Is that okay, everybody? It's just that simple, man. When I don't consider God, on my mind here, when my mind is filled with, with, with natural things, I'm counting, I'm measuring, I'm buying, I'm selling. There is no peace here. And all who have the mark of the beast, and I, and I love that it describes who has the mark of the beast. It doesn't make a difference if you're rich or poor. We're both enslaved by the same system. Money doesn't take you from the system. Money enslaves you as much as poverty enslaves you. Amen, everybody. Yes, yes. It's not like you get to a certain amount of money and then you're free from the system. No, you're not. Never free. Amen. Both rich and poor. Amen. Because now you have money and you think, oh, I've received the blessing. What? I've acquired. What? What? There's something that's equal to us all. And it's called life. Yes. And it's abundant and it's free and it's rich and it's full. Amen. Nothing divides us. We all have this greatness and we, we, we draw these lines in regard to. And we, we call the blessing things that are not the blessing. The blessing is life. The blessing is considering God. The blessing is not the mark of the beast for the mark of the beast that buys and sells. So just because you can buy more and sell more <laughs> don't mean it's not the mark. But I like that it says that it's the mark that allows us to buy and sell. And God wants to take us from this system. Well, what will deliver us from this thinking, this mentality of constantly working in business? I think God wants us to reconsider our lives in a certain way. You know what goes on? The next verse, the next verse is in chapter 14. It says this. It says, the lamb and the 144,000. It says, then I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him one who had 144,000. And it says this, they didn't have the mark of the beast on them. It says they had the father's name written on their foreheads. They had their father's name written on their foreheads. Those are the ones who were delivered from the mark of the beast. You can be delivered from the number of the mark of the beast by, by, by just thinking about the things of heaven and the things of God. You're delivered from the mark of the beast by very simply, everybody, consider God. Consider God. Take a moment to ponder, to look for God in the world, in the earth, in your life, to look for the whys and the how comes, right? To discover what life is truly about. Yes. You see, our deliverance from this mark of the beast, it's, it's the having the mark of God. It, it's considering God. It's us taking time in our day. To consider God. You know, you know, some of you guys were, were raised in church. Some of you weren't. Some of you guys were raised with the understanding you had to have your morning meditations. You got to read your Bible. Like we were raised. Like, did you read your Bible today? Right? Did you pray today? Right? Things like that. Some of you. Right? And some of you know that it's always, you know, it's, you know, we're told all the time you have to have your daily meditations. But it's not a, it's not a chore. It, it's what frees us from the system of the world. My God, if we need to be forced to exit the system of the world, then be forced to do it. If you need to be forced to consider God, then let it be until, right? Consider God, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, man. I mean, you don't even have enough time in the morning to shower, get your coffee, and run out the door. Consider God. I'll consider God. I'll give him a thank you, Jesus, as I'm flying out the door. Maybe. <laughs> consider God. I don't have any time to consider God. Because we have listened to some lie. God can cause your, your, your life that you're running after to crumble in a moment. He'll give you nothing but time. You know that, right? But it's, it's just an illustration, right, to show you that these things that we're chasing are empty. They're empty, man. We think we don't have time to consider God. God is the creator of eternity. Aren't we fools? Yes. Aren't we fools? Yes. It's the fool who says in his heart, I have no time. It is the fool who will tell the God of, of, of creation, of eternity, the one who created time itself, to say, I have no time to see you, to talk to you, to meditate. I have no time to spend with you today. It is the fool that says in his heart, it is me in my heart and you in your heart. 
That says, I don't have time for God. I don't have time for you. It is the fool that says, I don't have time for you. I don't have time to consider your situation, your person, your, your relationships, your life. It is the fool who says that. The one who, amen, the one who has, who has turned the house of prayer. You are a house of meditation, my goodness. God created you. He designed you. He made you. And he said, you are a house of prayer. And you said, no, I'm a house of business. Wow. Wow. We really believe. The, I believe it. You believe every, every human being, both rich and poor, bonded free. Everybody has believed that. We tell the God of eternity. Oh my, the one who can cause time to stand still, to cause the sun to stand still in the sky. We have the audacity to tell him about time. Yes. Come on, preacher. About our busyness and our scarcity. Uh -huh. The one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, who owns all the gold, if you think it's valuable in the mountains, all the diamonds under the ground, the one who owns it all, who creates wealth, say, I don't have enough, oh God. And you have the breath of God inside of you. We have an abundant life because we're eternal. There's something eternal and abundant about us all. You have access to it. You can live there. You can pierce the, the, the natural realm and look into the, the invisible realm at any moment of any day. You have that power yes. to sit in your chair and to look through the emptiness of sky or, or the fullness of the sky. You can pierce through it and you can yes. see into eternity. Yes. And you can see God and you can see yes. purpose and you can see the whys and the, yes. the how comes. And all of the other business of the world means nothing. It's a lie. It's, 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 it's an illusion. Amen. Amen. And you'll feel in that moment all of your fears melt away. Have you, have you ever felt that one? When you take the moment, when you're surrounded and overcome by all of the business of the day, when you take a moment to consider God and pierce through the, the busyness of the day to see God, haven't you had all of your fears melt away? Felt elated above it all? Like you sat where God sits? Yes. Yes. Above it all. Above it all. This is also an invitation, I believe, from God. It's an invitation. He says, come, consider this. My goodness. You know, there's a passage here in, um, in Luke. I want to read another passage. It says here, we, we've alluded to it earlier, it says, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God and money, right? For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. I believe mammon here is the God of wealth. And you can't serve both. You cannot serve the God of everything, the true God, the God of all that is, and the God of wealth. You can't serve both. Now, it's interesting because we're told here in Scripture, God is, very rarely do you get these dualistic kind of teachings from Jesus Christ. He's usually a kind of, it's a black or white, it's both. But not here, you know. Is it good or bad? It's both, right? Is it up or down? It's both. That's usually the answers that Jesus gives, right? But not here. But not here. He's quite dualistic here. He says you can't do both. Yes. You can't serve God and the God of mammon. It's one or the other. That's interesting. Because I believe I can do both. We believe we can do both. But somehow, somehow, something is stolen from us with that understanding. Many of us, including myself, we're confused with, with, with an obsessive, I would have to say, attitude about money. I mean, the, the, the most purest of us, the one who thinks that you're untainted by money, I say all of us are affected by it in, in a confused way, in, in, a, in, a, in a somehow uh, a selfish way. You can't. It, it's, I don't know, man. It's just, I don't know. I haven't found the person yet, myself included. Somehow it still affects us. There's hardly anybody who can think clearly about it. Hardly anybody. Some of you might beg to differ. That's okay. But you can't serve both God and mammon. Mammon is the God of wealth. It's the God of money. It's the God of success. And we're driven by it. We live by it. We wake up every day by it. We measure everything and everyone by it. It's such an ugly thing. Is it an ugly thing? I think it's ugly. I think it's real ugly, man, when you measure someone according to the standards of this world of money and wealth and success. 
My goodness, as if Joseph the dreamer was not a success. Oh, yeah, God blessed that man for dreaming. He saved the whole world. He only saved the world. Guy sitting in the fields dreaming, right? Yeah, he saved the world. Mm-hmm. Someone has to be a thinker. You know, Mammon, it's the God of all these things. And I, and I, and I must say that in the Gospel of Luke, it describes Mammon as a, as a kind of illness. Like Mammon becomes a source of disorder because all people allow it to, to have a certain claim on their life that only God should have. Like we allow Mammon to have a certain claim over our life that only God should have. And, and you know this to be true, every human being. Man, you know that money controls us. It controls what we do. It controls why we do what we do. Man, God Almighty, mammon will keep you from church. It'll keep you from the things of God. You won't go to church on Sunday because you got work on Sunday. Oh, my goodness. And you won't go to church on Sunday because you're tired from, 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 from work on Friday. You're not even working on Sunday. You're sleeping, but you're working on Monday. I mean, very rarely have I heard it said, oh, I can't come to work Monday, I'm tired. But I hear, it's okay, I'm just talking to you, right? But I hear it all the time, can't come to church Sunday, not feeling too good, a little tired now. My day of rest. <laughs> but God forbid, God forbid, consider this. I, 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 I um, exhort you to consider this. Take Monday off. Don't take Sunday off. You need a day off? Anybody? You tired? Sister Sandra, you tired? You need a day Who needs a day off here? Anybody? Take Monday off. Take tomorrow off. Don't take today off. Take tomorrow off. You don't worship money? Then take tomorrow off. Sit in your chair and go stare into the sky. <laughs> Because huh. we're really not tired. Well, we are tired, but, but we still serve the God of Mammon, though. We're still serving the wrong God. Man, we won't do that, though. No, we won't do that. I say to you, I say to you, just consider this. Consider it. Because you can't serve both. You can't serve God and mammon. Now, I'm not saying this to get you on church on Sunday, because I know that battle's gone. <laughs> You're only going to come if you feel like it. Pastor Phil and I, we know this. <laughs> but still consider your life, though. Forget about church. Consider your life. And, 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 and that God gave you a gift and, and, and you, are, you are backed up by heaven itself. He says, I created to be, to be a house of prayer and meditation, not a place of business. You should be the ponderers, the thinkers, and, and the philosophers. Amen, everybody. So, so I must say, I must say, mammon, it, it, it's like, it, uh, like an illness. It, it, it's, it, it takes over. When, when we think that life is counting, weighing, measuring, and deserving, we, 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 we go to places, listen, this is, this is, this is interesting too. We, it's so ingrained. I'm just going to talk a little bit more than I'll stop, but it's so ingrained. It's like we even want the sales, you know, like we're so ingrained about watching money and saving money. And, and like we'll go to a sale. I remember one time, you know, everybody wants to go to a sale and say, thank you, Jesus. I got a good price on this. I was blessed. I remember one time I, um, there was something that I wanted or, or whatever. And, um, you know, um, I got a good price for it. And I say, oh, praise God, I got a good price for it. But why is it praise God I got a good price for it? Or why, 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 why can't I just praise God that, that he would give me enough money to pay the full price for it, you know? Like, why do we always need the sales? Why, do we, why don't we always just think? I'm just talking about our mindsets, right? Why don't, why don't we live a, a life of abundance? Like, just go, do, live, be, whatever. Why are we always counting and measuring? You believe God for a sale. You believe God for something to be given to you. You believe God for that kind of a blessing. Why don't you just believe God to, to have, have enough to do whatever needs to be done? Whatever God wants you to do, you will do. You will have enough to do whatever God wants you to do. You will always have enough to do whatever God wants you to do. Uh-huh, it's just the truth. But it's, it's a different kind of um, uh, ment mentality. To participate in the reign of God, we have to stop counting. Interesting. We have to stop weighing, measuring, and deserving 
in order to, 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 to let like love and forgiveness and mercy, all these, all these things that are beyond transaction to happen in our lives. God wants to bring us to a certain place in life where we start measuring and counting. And, and let God speak to you and let him bring you there, everybody. We can't earn it. We can't lose it. As long as we stay in this world of earning and losing, buying and selling, it's like when we stay in that world, I mean, then it, 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 it seeps into all areas of our lives. If I'm weighing and measuring and counting everything, I'll tell you what I'm also weighing and measuring. My love for you. I measure everything else. God knows I'm, I, I measure, I'm counting my love for you too. When you live, because you can't, you can't draw a dividing line. I won't, I won't measure money, but I will measure uh, blood. It's, 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 it's a system it's a, that you live in, counting and measuring and weighing and deserving and justice. So if I, if I believe in counting and measuring and, 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 and penalty and punishment, then I also will measure my love to you in regard to when you get it and why you get it, whether you deserve it. I'll also measure my forgiveness for you, the mercy that I give to you, the grace. Everything is measured then. That's not the kingdom of heaven. There's something beyond this realm. Mm -hmm. It's beyond all of that, everybody. And I think God wants to bring us to something that is beyond all of that. I think he wants us to, to bring us into a place of abundance, a place of, of, of faith, if you will. Amen. Let me leave you with this. In this natural world, with this natural kind of thinking, it is a world of scarcity and anxiety. We will constantly live not having enough and, 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 and live with a heart of anxiety. But God does invite us into a greater place. I, I like to read the passage from Isaiah where it says, it says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. It says this, everybody. It says, you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and, me, uh, uh, buy wine and, and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight in, he wants you to delight in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Here and your soul will live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Amen, everybody. Amen. And then I close with this final verse because this one struck me this morning. And God says again, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts are higher than yours. God invites you into an abundant kind of living, an abundant kind of thinking. You consider that. Consider that this week, if you will. Amen. Take a moment to look into the sky and just consider. Amen, everybody. God bless you all. I'm going to ask you all to stand, and I praise and worship team if you'll come forward. Let's worship the Lord for a minute. Amen. Thank you for that worship team. God is the very breath of life. I like how you started, Pastor. It's not what we acquire, it's what we become. I immediately thought the two become one. <laughs> we got to become more like God. We have to become more like God. I believe it's one of the Psalms that also says that the Lord sits in the heavens and looks down upon the children of men. Do any understand? But they go astray. <laughs> It's actually both of the passages where he says that the fool says there is no God. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, if you want to do a little homework. But I also thought about the passage also where it says, uh, he says, Take no thought of what you will eat or what you will wear, for life is more than food and raiment. Yes. He says, Consider the ravens. They don't sow. Do I not take care of them? Consider the lilies. Do they not grow? They don't toil. They don't spin. Which of you, by measuring can add one cubit to your stature. There's nothing to add, church. You have the fullness of Christ inside you. There's nothing to add. It's just who we are. It's who we become. We become like Christ, amen? Let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, uh, we're grateful always, Lord God, to be in your house, Lord God. We're grateful, Lord, because we get to sing praises and worship you, Lord. So we, we thank you, Lord, for the lungs to do that this morning, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, uh, for the word that uh, our pastor brought forth this morning, Lord God. 
And we pray, Lord, that we would be shut for business, Lord God. Shut our lives down, Lord God. That we would take no thought of anything else but you, Lord God. For what you are doing, for what you've already made us, Lord God. And that we would consider the lilies of the field, Lord God. They just arrayed in your beauty, Lord. So we thank you this day, Lord God. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord God. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord God. And yes, we thank you for this house, Lord God. We pray your blessings on all that are here today and online, Lord God. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.